I appreciate you sincerely for that. And uh, that informed my staying with you all through last week and uh, coming on again today. And uh, the theme you have chosen is a very apt one and quite relevant. Uh, a whole session might not be enough to take everything, but uh, it's a good thing that we are uh, dwelling on the core issues to research. Uh, it has rightly been said last week that a pharmacist in the hospitals they are the window of the profession. Right. And I also tell me. add to it that um, there is a mine of data that a hospital pharmacist sit on alongside with community pharmacists, but much more the hospital pharmacist. And uh, that was what informed my interest in uh, researching in administrative issues, pharmacy administration issues relevant to the hospital. And what I plan to do this afternoon is um, I have quite a number of things to share with us. But most importantly, since we have been taking through, taking, taking through the routine, of conducting a research. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, ma'am. We can hear you, ma'am. So since you have been taken through the rudiments of conducting a research by professors Eru and uh, Opera last week, I plan to give to us possible researchable topics in hospital and administrative pharmacy alongside with um, possible research instruments. Yeah, for people like us that delved into uh, pharmacy administration or social and administrative pharmacy, we had a tough time stabilizing in that area since we have been used to the basic pharmaceutical sciences way of conducting research. But then having been taught over the years, we have come now to understand. So what I'm saying up front is that uh, the research instrument that we use in pharmacy administration, in clinical pharmacy, in a social and administrative pharmacy, they are quite different from what we use in our laboratories. Now, for instance, I had my postgraduate degree in pharmaceutics. So, I mean, I dread quite a lot in pharmaceutical technology laboratory. But moving on to the social sciences background of pharmacy practice research, you see that the research instruments are quite different. Well, even though they are, uh, they are soft instruments, not the hard core instruments like a, a frabilator or disintegrating apparatus or gagamula canta or such things. So I also plan to show us some of these research instruments because you need these instruments, you need these tools to be able to carry out your research exercises in pharmacy practice. So I'll start off with, um, as I mentioned, I have quite a lot of slides to share with us and uh, I'll just run through some of them as I speak to them. So the first one I want to show us is, um, I'm trying to get it open here. Sorry, pardon me. Okay, no problem, ma. Mm. Okay, whichever one opens, I'll I'll just start off with that. 
I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay, um, now, I said we have a lot of work that we can carry out in uh, researching into hospital practice. So I just okay. want to project to Ross one of the studies that we carried out. The essence of carrying out a research is to look for ways to solve problems. So, as you can see the title, Outpatient Dispensing Operations and Patient Waiting Lines in Hospital Pharmacies. What prompted me into this study was a challenge I had when I was a hospital pharmacist and I discovered that uh, patients would wait in long queues, wanting to collect their medication, to have their prescriptions filled. So when I found myself in this area of academics, I just thought about it. That is there no way to reduce patient waiting lines? Must there be patients waiting to have their prescriptions filled? Are patients satisfied after waiting for so long? You'll agree with me that definitely no. And at the end of the day, the pharmacists are at the receiving end. Even though the patients must have waited in the doctor's clinic, patients waited at the uh, medical records and such things. But the last spot of call being the pharmacy, making them to wait again, tells on their patients. And patients having to wait on end, definitely, you, you know, uh, undermines the effectiveness of hospital pharmacists. So we set out to carry out this study. So how did it go? So I'll just show us briefly in the outline. As I mentioned, you see that dispensing is our core activities and there are considerable delays. And this results in patient kills, particularly at peak periods. You see, I've been asked to talk about case studies in pharmacy administration. So what I'm trying to do is that uh, to give us some published work. So this is one of the published work. And then of course, as we go through it, I also want us to know that when you are setting up an outline of a paper, what are the things you need to put into consideration? When you are carrying out a research, what are the areas you have to uh, address? One, you must have a researchable topic. And then of course, you must have a background to the study and that is what I mean by introduction in this paper outline. And then what are the objectives? What do you set out to do? Like I was attempting to answer a question in the morning. You don't just collect data unless you have a, a topic to work on, unless you have objectives. What do you set out to do? And then you think about what method am I going to use? We have been taking through quite a number of them. Are you going to use a cross-sectional study? Are you going to do just a case study? Is it going to be a survey? Are you going to uh, just gather your data by observation or by interview? 
or is it just going to be focus group discussion or a questionnaire survey? You see, questionnaire survey is a research instrument, but many people tend to think that that's the only instrument you can use. I've discovered that even many of our postgraduate students, once they, they have a topic, they start thinking of questionnaire. But questionnaire is not the only thing that you can use. So as I'm taking you through these samples, I just want you to observe what are the instruments that were used in these various studies. We now have your results, which you have, uh, you have your data which you analyze to obtain your results. You now discuss it, you have a summary, and make recommendations. So as I said, what's the background to this study? Patients waiting lines in the hospitals. Well, every hospital pharmacist will do a lot of dispensing and it's a core activity. And there are delays because you need to proofread the prescription. You need, if possible, to cancel to look out for the medication. And then at peak hours, this can be very, very daunting. So the objectives of the study were to examine the dispensing procedure. In other words, we have to start from somewhere. What is really the procedure? What is causing the problem? And then, of course, we look at what are the various activities. That's what I mean by task elements that are contributing to the delay. And then what are possible strategies we can use to overcome this delay? This is one of the studies that can be categorized as quality improvements of hospital pharmacy uh, services. So what method did I use? I used direct observation of the dispensing workflow. So you can see observation there. So that is a research instrument. I didn't just go ahead and design a questionnaire. What for? I needed to know what is on ground. So, but then certain individuals I work on it before. So I used to e dispensing workflow and then checklist, I modified it. So then I again use a work sampling method. I'll tell you what I mean by that. For those of us that have done a bit of management, you might have heard about Frederick Taylor. You see Frederick Taylor, that time, you know, they, they put scientific uh, talks to uh, work processing. And they came up with terms such as time study, motion study, so it was that time study, you know, I extracted from that uh, Frederick Taylor. So work sampling is part of that management technique. And then there are key models to characterize the waiting lines. So these are some of the tools that may be used. And then, of course, I tried to simulate. In other words, you know, seeing that maybe there were two pharmacists dispensing at the time they were killed. Then I started thinking, assuming we had four pharmacists, will the kill be reduced? But you see, since this is uh, a case study, a lifetime thing, I couldn't go ahead immediately and recruit two more pharmacists to make them four. Neither will I be able to tell the management to recruit two more pharmacists. Assuming tomorrow we don't have such kill, then all those pharmacists will be idle. And there's no way you lay them off again. So what I now did was I use a simulation technique. So simulation technique is a modeling technique that is supposing there are four pharmacies. Would there be a reduction in the key, you know? And will it be profitable at the end of the day to the organization? And then at the same time, will the clients be satisfied of the services of the pharmacist? You see, why this is of interest to me is that now we are talking of the expanded role of pharmacists. We are talking about pharmaceutical care. We are talking about medication therapy management. We are adding on to the tasks of the pharmacist. So definitely, there will be the need to actually streamline what do we do? What is our workload? Do we need more hands? It is this type of study that will give you something objective to present before the management that two pharmacists will not be sufficient to do this work. It's not just uh, uh, a, 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 a play of words or whatever. 
It's not a talk shop, but we should be able to have something objective to be able to demonstrate that you really need more hands, that the workload indeed is much, and there may be the need for more personnel. So these are some of the tools that we used. And then, of course, now this is a tool. I call it a checklist. So the first thing I did was to observe in the dispensing procedure, what does a pharmacist do? And you'll agree with me that all the things I itemized there, there's initial contact. For instance, you may ask the patient, which ward are you coming from? Or which clinic are you coming from? It could tell you I'm from the cardiac clinic, I'm from the ophthalmology clinic, or I'm from O and G. So there is that initial, how long does it take? We put the time there. Then you tell the, you, you look through the prescription, you give it back to the patient and tell the patient to go pay. The patient comes back and submits the prescription, which you vet again, and then you now do the dispensing and hand it over. And then of course you clear up, particularly if you have to do uh, some extemporaneous preparations. So what did we obtain? You will see the figures, you know, I came up with some figures. Having done that initial observation, looking at dispensing flow charts and time elements, I just took a stopwatch and I did the timing for all those procedures. Now, this, um, this is a very interesting one. The, um, what I obtain, how come it's, it's interesting, which I, I think you may also find it interesting. I use some uh, engineering, engineering uh, terminology to put in there because I had some training also in technology management. So as you see, all these ones, the D, they are the delay. They are what constitute the delay. The O are the operations. In other words, they are the things that should be done to get a prescription filled. Let's take, for instance, the attendant greets patients. He now moves to pharmacy's bench. There's a sort of a delay there. And in some hospitals, you will see that it's even an attendant that will collect the prescription. The patient does not have initial that initial contact with the pharmacist. So that delay is there and is adding on to patient waiting line. For it's until the pharmacist checks the prescription, that is an activity that is irrelevant, germane to getting the prescription filled. So you can also see now the patient calls the attendant to pick the prescription. Why is the pharmacist not giving the, the prescription directly to the patient? to go pay. So all these things, they constitute delay. So I think from there, you can understand what I mean by that staff process chart for outpatient dispensing operations at Obafemi Awolowo University in Hospital. This study was carried out in three of our hospitals, at Oshogo, the Lautech Teaching Hospital, UCH, and at Obafemi Awolowo uh, University. And this is the time element that I came up with. So you could see the extent of the delay. At the end of the day, the percentage delay is 74.9% of the time that the patient spent having his prescription, uh, having his prescription uh, dispensed. So only just 25.10% are responsible for the processing of the prescription. So similarly, you have the figure for Lao Tech Teaching Hospital and for University College Hospital Ibadro. Then this is a flow chart. In other words, as the prescription is received, the pharmacist vet it. So is the aid item available? If it is not available, the patient they will leave. If it is not available, it could also go to the doctor or you could call the doctor to review the prescription. And the patient now comes back to give the prescription to the pharmacist. 
And then, of course, the procedure goes ahead. So you'll agree with me that all this procedure, if automation should come in, like if the items are not available, then the pharmacist, rather than the patient going over to see the doctor again, which may cause another delay, the doctor could be called up by the pharmacist. So that is the essence of this. But you see, I'm just trying to let us know when we are carrying out a research, these are the various tools that we could use. You see that in all these instances, it's by observation. And then, of course, simply timing it. So everything is not by uh, questionnaire design or whatsoever. Then these are the results. I've already explained. I've seen it for components. And they said most of patients' waiting time is delayed. You know, which takes about 73% of the overall. And the process is just 4 minutes, 61 seconds. I mean, 4.61 minutes. That was uh, what we were able to observe. And then I, also, I was also able to identify what caused the longest delay prior to payment. You know, for instance, uh, at, um, at the, the UCH, UCH, we discovered that they had uh, a dedicated payment point. What's dedicated payment point. Unlike in some other places, uh, slightly at the OATAC, when anybody could come to the Acacia point to pay, and that could also lead to another delay. So it was then we recommended that they should have a cashier point specifically dedicated to the pharmacy. You know, but in some of the other hospitals, the patient could also go, well, they will go to where other people from other clinics or from the people wanting to pay for diagnostic or whatsoever will also queue up and for them to make their payments. So, uh, yes, that is where we made the recommendation. One payment point in the pharmacy. So that we, are, we were recommended an increase in number of payment units, that this will reduce the delay. And it has potential for improvements, buttressed by the short delay observed prior to filling the prescription. Because part of the delay, which we discovered, was that patients had to queue up again where they made the payment. But you see, unless we carry out this study, Nobody will believe us. They will think it is only at the pharmacy, that is the pharmacist that keep delaying them. Whereas the processing time for filling the prescription was just about three or four minutes. But the patient at the end of the day had to wait for about 30 minutes. We might think 30 minutes is not much. But you see, you just spent four minutes out of this 30 minutes. So what I'm saying in effect is that objective analysis of our work system will uh, give us a case, you know, to, to discuss with the management. So uh, from the study, we were able to identify the delay activities. And then we made recommendation for a restructuring of the pharmacy layout, appropriate to reduce movements. And that will reduce the total patient waiting time. Part of our recommendation was also that there should be a waiting area for the patients, when this study was carried out early 2000, the current waiting area we had at the uh, pharmacy shop of OHTSC was not there. The patient would just queue outside and in the sun. But I mean, it was gratifying that after the study, they thought it fit to make, well, slightly comfortable waiting area and sitting area for the patients while they wait. So you see, the, this, uh, this is one of the uh, advantages of conducting a research. So maybe when you, have, uh, when you have the study, you'll be able to have more detail of uh, the write-up. And subsequently, we now made recommendations looking using the Keyring model, you know, Kill model is a simulation technique. It's one of these our uh, 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 operational modeling 
And I was able to say now, assuming we have four uh, pharmacists or we have uh, two servers, that's servers are the pharmacists. So with two service channels, the patient will spend five to six minutes. So, and then the pharmacist will be used about 7.8% uh, of the time. So we now try to look at it. Now, assuming we have more than two servers, more than two, uh, two pharmacists, how long will the patient wait? So these are the essence of maybe the key model or the simulation, simulation technique that we teach you probably in your, uh, in your postgraduate work. So, so you can see now the waiting line parameters. You see using uh, different uh, clients, different uh, number of servers, okay? And this was uh, what I used when you talked about the utilization time. The utilization time just means that uh, for an average uh, server, for how, how, how much of the time are you using? So that is what it stands for. Like for instance, the row B and C, I said the utilization factor is 0 0.70, which means the, the, the pharmacist is busy 70% of the time or 65% of the time. So there's, uh, there's some um, intricacies when it comes to that, but it's just a possibility. These are some of the things that may be used. So, so much, for that study. So I said, application of key models to waiting line show that the utilization factor was low. In other words, the servers, the pharmacists were being used 4% of the time and 70% of the time for each of the facilities with four service channels. So you will see that uh, to employ somebody a whole day and use that individual for just 4%, of the number of hours they will spend at work is a bit low and uh, might not be profitable to the organization, but we were able to juggle it, you know, appropriately. I say considerable delays were observed in dispensing in the three hospitals. And what were the reasons? The existing work procedure and the volume of manual transactions are the paying matters. So we also suggested that. Uh, the, the payments could be uh, computerized if necessary, okay? And then the operational problems, structural facilities, the process of service delivery, they, they could be modified. The layout of the pharmacy could be modified. There's an introduction of electronic or automated devices. There are possible strategies. You know, the pharmacists were likely predisposed to embrace this. And so these are some of the findings, you know, with, with respect to that particular work. Um, now, let's, let's go on to other one. I, I talked about the management techniques for work analysis, because we are talking about workload. So what are some of the uh, techniques that you can use to analyze your workload. So I've mentioned this one's work sampling, time study, which I used in that, uh, in that research I've just presented. Motion study, fatigue study, method study. These are all from the work of Frederick Taylor, bringing scientific thoughts into the management of work. So I've defined what work sampling is. You know, for instance, now the dispensing procedure is a work. What are the activities involved in this? You know, but you now apply statistical sampling techniques to study the work activities. And as I just used that dispensing as an example, it could even be patient counseling. It could even be medication therapy management. It could be you are doing one-on-one -on -one pharmaceutical care to the patient. So it's a work that you can analyze. You see, and all these things are very important because as time goes on, we will need to make claims, you know, particularly incentives, payments with respect to these activities that we're asking the pharmacist 
to add on to the current uh, work schedule in the hospitals. So these are the various applications of the work sampling method. To indicate the nature of the distribution of the work activities, maybe in the, in the hospital pharmacy, you have various levels. You have the intern, the pharmacist grade one, you have the pharmacist, uh, senior pharmacist, the principal, the uh, 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 director, deputy director, assistant director, and such things. What does each category do? What do you think each category should be doing? This is one of the things that is a challenge to me as a researcher. Can any one of us say these are the activities that uh, the different categories of pharmacists do? We just lump everything together. I made some attempts at carrying out this study, and I had some findings with respect to what pharmacists do in the hospital. So that's what I mean by distribution of the work activities. Then the percentage of utilization of, of uh, groups of similar machines or equipment, all similar groups, all the grade one pharmacists, what do you want them to start doing? The senior pharmacist. So remove the machine or equipment now. The similar category of uh, your workers, and then determine the productive and non-productive utilization of clerical operations. Just as I did in that analysis, we were able to identify the non-productive time there. Then to measure the performance to indicate how materials and equipment are used or how the pharmacies themselves are used. So then time studies can be, can be defined. You know, we should be able to say that this is the amount of the, an average time that a pharmacist can spend in counseling. I know at uh, Federal Medical Center or Purpose Built, they have pharmacists in counseling rooms that patients can go in there. Have we ever sat down and say, how long does it take me to cancel a patient? It may not be the same time for everyone, but we should be able to see it on an average. This is how long it takes me. And this is the percentage of my time that the counseling takes. Then time study. So that was the, uh, this was a technique I used in observing the procedural elements of dispensing activities in the pharmacy. And uh, you can just use just a simple um, uh, machine, I mean, a simple timepiece, you know, watch clock for you to be able to determine how long it takes for each of these activities. So you see the advantage of using this method is that it helps you to calculate labor costs and framing suitable incentive skills, schemes. So that was what I mentioned the other time. As time goes on, we want to get paid for medication therapy management, for pharmaceutical uh, care. So this is a type of study that can help us to come up with it, that we spend this much time. So time taken in doing a task is assigned to a worker by using time measuring device such as a stopwatch, such as a stopwatch. So you don't need, uh, you don't need fantastic equipment, you know, and uh, with, with our smart watches, you can easily even use your watch. What's the purpose? You say, determine how much time you spend on the job, a fair day's work, to frame incentive scheme, to determine the number of workers, you know, to be allocated to that particular task. So, so much for that type um, of, uh, the type of activities, as I mentioned. Now, I want to show us um, the different types of other instruments. I've told us about the survey, the observation as a questionnaire survey, we're all used to that. So I'm projecting another instrument. This is a data collection form. Like for instance, you want to do prescription audits. If you want to do prescription audits, 
if you if you want to do the prescription audit, this one was adapted from my own in root study, international rational use of drugs. So you pick up a prescription, assuming you want to sample uh, about 200 prescriptions. I did a study on prescription pattern in the, at the uh, OAUTHC, and I sampled up to about uh, 4,000 prescriptions. But for me to be sure that I am collecting, uh, I have the field of data I'm collecting is the same. So I need to design a data collection form. And so that is what I call the prescription audit form. This is also important if you are doing an interview. If you are doing an interview, I will advise you, you have an interview schedule. Don't just feel that, well, uh, I just get some points from the individual. What you are getting from person A, by the time you get to person B, you might not remember to ask a similar question. And after you have uh, returned from your field trip, you will start regretting that, oh, I wish I have asked that question. So for you to avoid that, what you do is that you have a, an interview schedule, a structured interview schedule. It's simply a list of possible things you intend to ask your respondents. So this is a similar thing I have done for prescription audits. The data field, you could see the serial number, that's prescription number one, number two, number three. What do I want to extract from there? Hospital number, yeah. if necessary. Date of prescription, the age, uh, the gender, the number of drugs, the drugs that are available, the ones that are not available. One of my intentions of carrying out this study was to find out the extent of stock out, you know, and then the extent of polypharmacy. So that's why I answered the question in the morning that for you to collect any data, you must have an objective in mind. You must have your research topic in mind. So, but because I knew that I wanted to know the extent of stock out. So that's why I put that on the field. So how many drugs were in the prescription? How many of them were out of stock? How many were prescribed in the generics? How many were antibiotics? Because we keep talking about antibiotic resistance. We cannot be talking of antibiotic resistance without actually knowing whether there are, every prescription contains antibiotic. And then, of course, you know, in a rural area, there's a mentality for the natives. If they have not been given an injection, the doctor has not treated them well. So we also want to find out from the prescription, is that mentality playing out that almost every prescription contains an injection? So that informed this research instrument that, uh, that I'm presenting before us. So I said, we are looking at the different types of research instruments. Okay, now we look at another one. So we have been so used to uh, questionnaire design. So the next one we are going to look at is a questionnaire. Okay, you see now this questionnaire, which have been designed to collect data on the health-seeking behavior of university students and evaluation of the health services at OLETAC. So I want you to note certain things in the questionnaire design. There must be a title. Where is the questionnaire coming from? Because, I mean, it's, it's very sad that you see some questionnaire, they are badly designed and then they decided the, the questionnaire must also have what is the title of what are you set out to gather information on the respondent needs to know and i want my patients 
I, I, I beg your pardon. I want my student, my postgraduate students, the title of your research work has a title for the question here. You modify it in a way because somehow you might be selling out your research topic to somebody else or knowingly. But you should modify but your questionnaire must have a title. And I also try to give it an acronym. I give it an acronym because by the time I'm discussing, I might have used two, three types of questionnaire. Instead of just writing out the whole thing again, I will simply say HSB dash uh, HS. You, I'll show you another one, another uh, instrument, which I gave an acronym to. And then you tell the respondents what is the purpose. If possible, you also introduce yourself. And then you tell them what exactly you want them to do. So as I we mentioned to Ross, there may be the need for about, uh, about demographic information, which I have called the bio data in this respect. And you see it goes on. And the bio data you are collecting, not just for its sake, how relevant is it to your work? You know, I put religion here because in the course of my study, I discovered that uh, some students will not go to the health center because they are, uh, they, are, they are trying to exercise their faith. For those of us that have passed through IFE, you will see that uh, many students will prefer to go to the sports center and keep praying for the illness rather than go to the health center. So I found that religion was relevant there. And then, of course, I said others, because some other people, they go native. So in this, my study, the religion is relevant. And then, of course, the registration. So you have to be sure of the relevance of the data you are gathering. And then your questionnaire will be in sections and well laid out. It must be very neat. So you don't just uh, uh, design a questionnaire anyhow. This is another instrument. What do I want to show you in this one? Is the way I've given an acronym to the work. Yes. You see that I call it PSS. What did you know? <laughs> it's a formula of happy. Okay. I'll tell me kiss this time. Okay, patient satisfaction survey. So I carried out, yes, we carried out this study to be sure that as patients satisfied with pharmaceutical services. So you see, I call it PSS. So in the same study, I also did our doctors satisfied with their pharmaceutical activities. I call that one DSS. I also said a nurses because they interact with pharmacists in the hospital. Are they satisfied with their activities? I call that NSS. So in the course of my discussion, I wasn't saying again patient satisfaction, so I just say PSS or DSS or NSS. So that is what I mean when I said your uh, instruments must be well laid out. And right from the onset, you have got to make up your mind how you are going to do the analysis. Because if your instrument is badly designed from the onset, you will run into a problem when you are doing the analysis. Let me give you uh, a personal experience. You see, when I, I told you it was a very, uh, a very big shift from the pharmaceutical sciences to social and behavioral sciences that I am in now. I designed a questionnaire and there was no bio data. And in fact, I carried out maybe over 500 and the respondents were very, the, the percentage respond, response was very nice. Now I wanted to start the analysis and I just discovered that there wasn't the biographical, the, the demographic data was not there. So at the end of the day, I wasted all the resources, wasted the responding time, wasted my own money, and I could not get anything out of that study because I missed out the demographic uh, section. 
Like for instance, I would have loved to know, are males, are male patients more satisfied than female? Those with higher education, are they more receptive of pharmaceutical services? What age range are more satisfied or are less satisfied with pharmaceutical services? People in which occupation, but I did not include it in my questionnaire design. <laughs> so that made it useless. All the efforts, all my attempts at uh, getting this thing across. So that's in a way as some of the uh, issues when it comes to your, to your design. Now, I want to show us this. I'm talking about your research instruments. You can get this online. I just decide to let you know that uh, carrying out a research is not a record, is not a rocket science. We all learn through this. And you get involved in research by doing it. Never mind you start small. Collaborate with somebody. I have had, I have done researches before that I collaborated with people working in the hospital, and they were able to make some publications. So let's seek to collaborate. So your weak areas, others will beef you up. But then you can also so get some things from the internet. I got this from the internet. This is a physician performance evaluation. You can reward this. You can use this as a template. That's why I call it template, survey monkey template. So you can say pharmacist performance evaluation. Time and again, you should be able to evaluate ourselves. You say, I crave your indulgence to use a passage of my Bible that says that uh, when, you, when, you, when you judge yourself, <laughs> you will not be judged. And in Yoruba language, we also have that, that if you know that you are in the wrong and you have already know your fault and you have confessed your fault, I mean, you will not stay long kneeling down and begging. So we can also do performance. We can do performance uh, evaluation in our hospital, in our community pharmacy. How do people see us? Are we doing what we are supposed to be doing? You see, one of the studies I once carried out was a service performance rating. In other words, I tried to see, yes, we do these activities in the hospital as pharmacists. And uh, are people receptive of these activities? So I surveyed the doctors, I surveyed the nurses. I said, these activities, you know, please rate the pharmacists on them. I made the pharmacists to rate themselves on the activities. The activities include dispensing of prescriptions. It, it includes uh, maybe health promotion within the hospital. It includes uh, cancer, uh, uh, is it giving advice or whatever to the doctors or medication, choice of medication? So I listed quite a number of them. I use the pharmacist practice activity classification by the American uh, health system pharmacist. So I adapted that uh, activity classification. So I now say pharmacist, rate yourself on this duty. So, and then how do you perform? How important are they? So I made the doctors do the same. I made the nurses that are your clients to do the same. I just discovered that uh, there are some instances we rate ourselves so high on some activities, but the, the rating, the acceptance to our clients is very low. You see? So that's why it's important. Periodically, we may have to do this. We may have to ask for the opinion of the patient. Am I really doing my dispensing well? Am I doing the counseling well? Are they receptive of this counseling? Is when they are satisfied with it that they will keep coming back. So then the other one, you also see hospital performance evaluation. Okay. So you can adapt any of this, any of these ones. Right. In other words, you can also look at the hospital environment. It is part of research that you can carry out. You know, the system you are working in. You can decide to evaluate the performance, how clean was the room, how, you know, that's uh, maybe from the patients. So that's why I came up with these uh, templates, then customer satisfaction templates, you know, how convenient is our company to use, how convenient is our pharmacy to use, 
you know, compared to other hospitals? Mm -hmm. Is our pharmacy, is our product better? Are we responsive as pharmacists? As I said, is a template which you can adapt in your own works. So you don't need to rewind the hand of the, the hand of the clock when you are looking out for research instruments. That's in a way is what I want to see. The customer service template. A community pharmacist can use this. A hospital pharmacist can use this. How long did you have to wait before somebody comes up to you? How well did we serve you? Okay. And then for even for those of us in the university, we can also use this. Our students can evaluate us. Are they satisfied with what you do? University faculty satisfaction, you know? And uh, even we, we can look at it among ourselves, you know? Are, are, we, are, we, are we, how do we fear on our job, you know? How is it easy to get the resources that we need? We can use this one to, uh, to assess the uh, work environment. So let me see if then, um, then this will also be helpful to us. Possible areas for research in pharmacy administration. That is what I put in table one. So say research distributed by topics. So look at the topics. You can decide to do management projects like consumer satisfaction, consumer use of the pharmaceutical experience, uh, uh, services. What are the user experiences? Are you able to give information to users? And then uh, information about the users. Like one of the studies I'm going to show us, I talked about uh, medicine information reflects. Uh, we, we insert medicine information reflects into the drugs. To all intents and purposes, this is our activities. Either we are in the industry or not. And we want the patient to have this information. Are they benefiting from this package insert? So we carried out a study. Are those uh, information, are they readable? Or we just throw it to them? When we give direction to our patients in the hospital, do they understand? So that's what I mean by user experiences. Okay, then you can do user opinion of pharmacists, like the waiting time, like the patient satisfaction is, is, uh, is user opinion, like the information leaflets. I will show you a, a published study on this. And then the drugs we are giving them, the long distance uh, customers. Maybe we have started uh, uh, e-pharmacy or tele-pharmacy, in which case you just take your phone and then you tell that somebody how to use the medication or such things. No, that, that sort of thing happened during the COVID lockdown. In which case, you just speak. I, I also did it. My little boy had uh, a slight skin infection. Knowing that, well, hospitals might not be welcoming at the time. I just took a snapshot of that. I posted it to about two, three doctors. And they gave me a prescription on that. So it was with that prescription. And uh, the boy got a relief from that skin infection. Similarly, I met a pharmacist that was doing door-to-door -door delivery of medications during the COVID-19. So you may want to assess the effectiveness of that. Then consultant pharmacist, the medication profile, the health economics, the uh, education we are given, you know, to the patients and all that. And then you can also do uh, practitioner researcher projects. Just as I said, that we, we do doctor satisfaction survey. You can also do a survey to look at their drug use in the hospital, their prescription pattern, you know? And I've given you an instrument whereby you can uh, use to carry out such a study. You can do internal information within the profession. That now we have uh, ACBN, we have uh, PIN, we have uh, NAPA, you know, you can do a cross uh, interest group evaluation. You know, what is our impression about the profession? We are talking about researches that can be conducted. There are borders on pharmacy administration. And then the working, the working condition, 
like a workload and stress among hospital pharmacists. Have we ever thought of that? The, the burnout, you know, and the community pharmacists too. Then the young people and their health, like the case I, I cited to you, Hesekin behavior, they were essentially targeted at uh, young, uh, uh, or the, the undergraduates, you know, their illness, the idea about illness, about drug use, about pharmacy, about use of the healthcare facilities. All these things are researchable, uh, researchable topics, you know. And uh, following from that, I have tried to suggest suggested research topics in pharmacy administration. I'll just give you a few minutes to read through them. I, I hope you can see my screen clearly. No. So, can you see the screen clearly? You're not sharing your screen, man. I'm not sharing the screen. No, man. All along, you have not been seeing the screen. No, 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 man. Just give me a few minutes. Okay. Somebody call my attention to that. Well, we thought uh, it is intentional, man. Hmm. <laughs> I rewind as much as I can. No problem. Can you see now? Not yet. Not yet. Not You're yet. Not here anymore. <laughs> no. What have happened? But I have an expert that is helping me here now. Okay. Hey, hey, you want to push one? Okay. Okay. Can we see it now? Yes, no, clear now. You can see it now. Fine. All right. Yes, man. Yes, ma'am, we can see it. You are sharing now. Okay. It's coming. So can you see those suggested uh, research topics? Just help me with the hydro cuts. Eh? Yes, ma, ma, can I meet yourself, ma? Can you, can you meet yourself, ma? Or meet yourself, ma? Can you meet yourself, ma? Or meet yourself, ma? Can you meet yourself? Okay. Yes, I, I, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Go, yes go okay. On. Okay. So, can you see the screen now? Yes, you can see it. Okay. So, I have said I'm suggesting some research topics in pharmacy administration. So, like, for instance, I've been talking about researching into the workload. So you can see that, uh, like item eight talks about um, workload and impact on hospital pharmacy's job satisfaction. Seven talks about workload pressure and the pharmacy workforce. <coughs> you see that uh, with the extended role we are advocating, you'll be experiencing more of the workload. That being as it may, therefore, there will be the need for us to get ready to do the analysis of our work system. 
So that's the intention of such a study. Okay. Then we talked about uh, item 11, computerization. Okay. Pharmacist attitude to automated medication dispensing. The work sampling, you can see that coming on again of upgraded outpatient pharmacy computer system, you know, impact of computerization. So these are possible things that you can do, possible researches. They are researchable topics that can be done. And then when we are talking about ethical issues, managing ethical dilemmas in pharmacy practice, when somebody is telling you to give him a, one month dose of uh, tranquilizer because he had not been able to sleep and he has found that I just take him every day, it, it calms him down, you know? That may be far-fetched really, but there could be some other issues, you know, relevant to that. So, uh, okay, I'll rewind this one. I want another, uh, another. Aha, can we see the prescription audit form? No, ma. Can you see it? No, 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 no. You have, you have to stop sharing the current slides. Oh, I stopped sharing the current slides. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, now. Then you cannot yes. share the new one. Do I not share the new one? Yes, ma'am. I see. Don't mind you. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Prescription audit form. Yes. Can you see it? We can see it, ma'am. Yes. yes, that's what I mean. But you must have a field. You know that when you are gathering data, you should have uh, in mind what you intend to gather from there. Like I told you that uh, I carried out a study on about uh, 500 a bit about uh, 4,000 prescriptions. So I already know what I want from each description. So, and I also said that uh, you may also want to conduct an interview. So you, you, can, you can have an interview schedule, in which case you make up your mind that these are the things I want to collect from each one. Follow me, last. No, it's okay. Okay, we can stop this and start. link up another one. Okay. Okay, I didn't know how to stop sharing. Which one? Okay, this one. This one. Yeah. So this is also part of the research instrument, which I talked about earlier on, but it's a questionnaire that we are used to. I'm not sharing yet, ma. I'm not sharing. Ah. <laughs> Just open and uh, go and share. You open first. Then you go and share, ma'am. That's, That's what I did. Okay, but it's not coming up. It's not coming up. Is it? This is it. Mm. Okay, now. Are you there? Are you seeing yes. it? Yes, now. Health yes, key behavior of university students. Yes. Are you, are you seeing it? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. What I talk about that is that when you are designing your questionnaire, there must be a title. There must be a title, and then you give it an acronym, HSB slash H. You just think of something you know, that when you are discussing, instead of writing the whole sentences over and over again, you just be using the acronym. Then I said you don't uh, use the title of your work as a title of your questionnaire, so that you don't sell out your work then there should be uh, an introduction. And then of course, uh, the necessary information. Now, if you don't need the information, you don't need to put it on the questionnaire and make it so bulky. Because in this study, religion is important because it's health seeking. I want to see the extent to which they attend the health center when they are ill. We discover that some people will not go because they want to pray about it or they want to use that uh, they have our preparation. So religion is relevant in this case. So you only share, you only include what you feel is relevant. Then I said, 
uh, bio data is essential because we may want to look at the effect of age or effect of uh, education or effect of gender on what you are discovering or what you are working on. So I now told you of uh, the mistake I made when I first started this type of research. I didn't put the demographic data and I went ahead to collect uh, uh, responses from over 500 people. At the end of the day, it was useless because I could not know whether it was a male or a female that responded or uh, uh, an illiterate or non-illiterate or a Christian or a Muslim that responded. Okay. So that was what I said on that one. Stop I stopped. I mm, want to share again. She could continue to want to eat it. Okay. Then the PS is this one. This one. So, uh, as I said, the And not this one. Let me share the mission. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No. You get this. This one. Yes. That's it. No, we have talked about that. <laughs> Sorry, you bear with us. No problem. Oh, you bear with me. <laughs> I think this one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Patient satisfaction survey. Are you seeing that? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> No, not that. No, not that. Go. That's it. This one, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Can you see it now? It's coming up. Yes, we can see it now. Yes. So, what I want to bring up, this is also a question here. But I want, just want to talk about the acronym. So like in the, in this, in the study where I use this, I have patient satisfaction survey, doctor satisfaction survey, nurse satisfaction survey. So what I simply did was I used PSS, DSS, NSS. So when I'm discussing, I don't have to start talking about the whole sentence again. So it's also a questionnaire, well designed. And then of course you have the bio data, so I put the bio data at the end. You see? So you don't miss, you don't miss that out. But that's another one. It's on the desktop. I can't find it again. It's, um, single body. It's a part Yes, I've used all of the results. I've used all of them. Yes, I've used all the research instruments. So this one I've used. Yes. So, 
I'm looking for it. So, you want to do so let us talk. Yes. Yes, that's it. Okay. <laughs> oh go. That's not it. And that's the one I'm concluding with. Okay. Mm. Don't need Yes. That's not it. You have minimized it. Sorry, we are, we are going on to the last one now. Okay, ma'am. It's just uh, appearing and disappearing. That's not it. That's not it. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, you can see it now. Case studies on research in pharmacy administration. Yes, clear. Very, yes, so <laughs> sorry. Can you go to I, slice you, ma'am? Can you go to slice you? Excuse me. Can you go to slice you? Slice you. Click on slice. Okay. Make it bigger. Make it bigger. Yes, down here. Yes. No, either at the top or at the bottom. Yes. Yes, that one. Yes. 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 Click on it. No, the one. Oh, I see. Anyone? Yeah. Oh, either up or down. Yes, that one. It's, it's up. Yes. We have seen it up. Yes. 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 From the beginning. Yes. Click on it. Yes. Okay. okay. Can you see it now? Better and bolder. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for the patience. So this is where I'm concluding. You know, actually I wanted to start from there, but I couldn't lay my hand on it. So, but it's like a summary of everything I've been talking about since. So I'll just give you uh, some published work. You know, I have given you some, some topics, some possible topics which you can research on. Uh, why is research important for the advancement of pharmacy practice? Then strengthen pharmacies provided services. Builds evidence base. You know, I kept talking about it, that uh, it's not just talk show. You must have something concrete to advance your case before management or to advance a policy. So it also improves patient care and contributes to health service knowledge. I said there are many faces to pharmacy administration, leadership and support. It exists also in community pharmacy, health system pharmacy, government ministries and all that. So 
and studies of various farm admin issues are considered in a systematic manner. You know, we, you have been taken through that last week. And it encompasses issues in pharmacoeconomics, health outcomes, pharmacy business administration. You see, you can see quite a lot, quite a lot of things. Consumer health behavior, like health seeking behavior that I gave you an instance, like patient satisfaction, okay? Policy issues, information management, medicine pricing, the pharmacy education itself, you know, operations management, you know, like the dispensing procedure that I mentioned to you, okay? Medicine supply management, see? So, like uh, I told you about the key model the other time, when I carried out a uh, operating procedure, dispensing procedure in pharmacy, you can have the Markov analysis, Markov modeling, okay? So all this one, they fall within the purview of pharmacy administration research. And I've given, I've suggested some topics for you. So now let's just quickly look at uh, a number of published case studies as I run up, okay? Patient response to waiting time, you know? This was motivated by looking at how patients wait online you know, how do they feel about it? We carried out that study. And you could see this was just an abstract of it. What's the purpose of the study as the aims and objectives, the method of analysis, you know, we did it by observation and by questionnaire survey. The questionnaire was administered, okay? Then uh, results and conclusion. But this is another one. Content validity of medicine information reflects. You see, the information we give to patients, are they useful? Because you see that uh, with the package insert, patient get, they, they pay for it. It might, it might be a small uh, percentage of what they are paying for the drug. So we should be able to give them what they need. So we looked at how readable were they. And then do they even check? all the information therein, okay? So this was how we carried it out. So we see that uh, we, didn't just, we didn't just ask them, do you read this, do you do, do that? We did a bit of that. But not only that, we took each of the information leaflets, we analyzed the content based on the standard, based on the summary product characteristics by NAFDA. So you see, I'm emphasizing the point that all your researches, they don't all have to stop and end with questionnaire survey. You know, you can do observation. You can look at a standard and compare your work with that standard. So that's a, a, the sort of thing we did here, right? And then we're able to come up with something useful, okay? You see, we saw that the information were not ordered, you know, properly. If you ask the patient this in a questionnaire survey, they don't have an idea of how the information should be ordered. But because you're a professional, you should be able to evaluate the different leaflets which you have collected. So there is another one, consumer satisfaction with communities, uh, pharmacies. Just as I talked about patient satisfaction with uh, hospital pharmacy services. See, the background, the objectives of the study, the method, it was a cross-sectional survey. Okay, you have been taken through this consecutive the sampling method, random sampling, and such things. And then, of course, the statistical analysis. Then you have the workload of pharmacists and the performance of pharmacy services. I, I hope we'll be seeing more of this workload issue with. Uh, our doctors of pharmacy are consultant pharmacists now. You know, you need to be able to evaluate your workload. Or do you just think that you can add on, which means you have not been working adequately enough before. Or if you have been working adequately enough, then the extended role is adding on something to you. I should make a demand on having increase in the number of staff 
in the different units. So this is a sort of study that we can use to ascertain that workload of pharmacists and the performance of pharmacy services so that we don't just keep on adding on to the, the, the dispensing workload, you know. So that was how the study was carried out. If you are interested, you can read more about that. And then perception of barriers to automation, selected hospital pharmacies in Nigeria. We also carried that out. That the first, there was, there was the first part to this study that talked about the attitude of pharmacists to automation. See, they were receptive of it. That well, the routine work will be taken over by automation. But then there was the barrier again that they feel that if the dispensing work is taken from them, what is a pharmacist doing? You see, but now that we are talking about the clinical component of our activities, then uh, this sort of study is important. Okay, so say so examine your perception of possible barriers to the introduction of automated techniques. Okay, this was a questionnaire survey. And then the results show that uh, pharmacists, they had fears, one about the feasibility, about the maintenance. Though there were potentials there, but some are, were considering that if we skill them, in other words, we take away their core activities, you know, but then, if we now emphasize our clinical component, pharmaceutical care, there should be no fear with respect to this. But this is a sort of study that can be carried out. Then, patient satisfaction, factors affecting satisfaction of patients. And then, these, uh, these researchers, they were trying to develop a questionnaire, you know? So incidentally, a test and measurement uh, personnel is here with me. We validate a questionnaire. Is it actually measuring what we intend it to, to measure? There have been so many, I've given you a template, but uh, a survey monkey template. But in our own local setting, is, would that instrument be adequate to actually tell you that patients are satisfied or they are not satisfied? So that is a sort of study that in the, this individual carried out. And we also carried out such a study with the construct validation of an instrument to measure patient satisfaction in the Nigerian context, you know, with the recommendation that uh, maybe tomorrow you want to carry out patient satisfaction in your hospital. You can use this, our instrument. So that was the intention of carrying out uh, that study. In other words, we already designed a patient satisfaction and which we used in another study. But now we're trying to validate it to tell people that we are recommending this, pretending it that it could be used to measure patient satisfaction. So there are so many uh, facets of carrying out a research. There are so many things we can do when it comes to uh, carrying out a research. And we're able to validate the study and it was published in a reputable journal, you know. So thank you very much. That's about all I have for you. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Ma, our guest speaker, Professor okay. Mrs. Olumi Afolabi, for that great educational and very impactful lecture on case study on research in social pharmacy and administration. We well, thank you so much, Ma. It's my pleasure. You give us numerous samples, methods, tools, templates, and instruments that have been validated to conduct research with this. And you ensure us that research is not a rocket science, that it is doable. You encourage us to go into collaboration. Thank you, Ma. We are highly blessed and honored by your lecture. Thank you. For the past 90 minutes, you have been speaking, lecturing us. I believe we are for benefited. Thank you so much, and God continue to bless you. Amen. Next on the agenda is the question and answer time and contribution. Members with interest can indicate by raising hand or by chat. So the floor is open now. You have been enabled to unmute yourself. 
So it's time for contribution of questions and for answer. Members, you have the permission to present or put your queries in the chat window. Let's go to speak a few. Members with uh, queries or contribution can raise hands or pass your queries to the chat windows so that we can read it out to the guest speaker. I will see you on the call. I can you please omit yourself, please, if you have uh, any question or to make contribution. Wow. Okay, I'm calling on our chairman, Dr. Kinsa Amibo. Please go ahead with your question, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bello. I want to join you in appreciating our erudite scholar, Professor Mrs. Afalabi, for a very interesting and stimulating lecture. I still put throughout the lecture with my my daughter, Ambairo, and uh, my, my, I can assure that my daughter is full. Uh, because uh, I, I did acquire uh, uh, many a lot of uh, new uh, knowledge today, so I'm very very grateful to you. Uh, you. My first question is: my first question is this: How do you test the uh, the, the level of um, significance for an observational study? I don't know if I understand that question. You, you do so much on. Uh, observational study in the course of this lecture. So now that you have, someone has uh, carried out successfully a, a research work and result is, is out there, how do you now test for the level of uh, significance? That is the first question. The second one is the, like this. Among uh, hospital pharmacies, hospital and analytic pharmacies in Nigeria, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, agitation for rot rotational leadership. Uh, amongst the, the head of departments. So there's, there's a clamor for the headship to be rotated amongst them, um, very senior colleagues, particularly with this advent of the constant pharmacy uh, approval. But the, the question now is, if one wants to co conduct a research, for instance, on the desirability of rotational headship amongst hospital families, I think that's, that's like a tentative uh, topic the desirability of rotational headship amongst pharmacies in the hospital uh, sector. Um, how? What kind of advice would you go? How will we go about that kind of a, that kind of a research work? And then uh, the last one. There was a question I asked earlier on, which of the what I could not handle. I said uh, after a research work, and uh, you've gotten your results. The, where you now want to, like in the area of uh, results, for instance, have like the average age of uh, a population, for example. I know that they normally do not write a particular age, maybe 25 years plus or minus, be 1.25 years. That aspect of the, one, the plus or minus. How do you get that, that last part? Is it by calculation or is there, is, it, is there, is there like on the computer now, is there some device on the computer that can give you all the, that particular information. I don't know if the question is clear. Thank you, ma'am. So there are three questions, you know. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, our chairman. Um, yes, ma'am. Concerning the observational study, we are talking about how do we validate or whatever. As I mentioned, uh, observation is an instrument. And there is a way in which you can carry it out in such a way that it will not be biased. Yes, that's the word. Not this issue of validating now. You want to eliminate bias as much as possible. There's what we call participant observation. Like, for instance, in one of my studies, 
because I have been a staff at the teaching hospital. And I was a regular visitor, a friend of the, of the place. So it was only the head of the department that knew I was carrying out a study. But I was going in there as if I was a member of that place. Because the issue is that if you are observing, there have been studies like that, that uh, when you are observing uh, some people at work, maybe they will now do the work more because they know you are observing them. Uh, I've forgotten what we, what we, what name we call it now. So, but the, your intention using that method of data collection is to eliminate bias as much as possible. So as much as you can, you can, you can make yourself a participant of that. Like for instance, there are some television programs which I've watched before where they talked about undercover, undercover boss. What happened in such a case is that uh, an individual will just come in and take on a job as a cleaner, not knowing he's, he's one of the managers in the company. So he will be doing the work. They will just tell you that somebody has been posted to your unit for big complaints, for instance. And the person will be doing the work just the way, the same way in which you are doing it. So it's at the end of the day, and he will be observing you. He will be observing every worker, their attitude to work. That will make them to appreciate what the many workers, what they go through. So that is what happens in observational study. You have to try as much as possible to minimize bias. There may be the need for you to tell them you are doing an observation. There may be the need for you to, to have uh, uh, surrogate clients. Surrogate clients might just be people that just pose as clients, whereas they are not necessarily, you know, they are not necessarily clients, but they must have gotten the information they want. Though some people, they still raise an alarm that there, are, that there could be certain ethical issues therein. But you must have obtained your ethical approval to carry out that study. So you don't do strict validation or whatever for observation. You just try as much as possible to minimize bias. Then you can also do content validity of it. That is, you have already listed out. You know, you know I told you with respect to interview, you do an interview schedule. So that's one, you can determine the content validity of it. But for observation, you try as much as possible to minimize bias. You can train some research assistants. Those ones will be like the surrogates, you no know, patients or whatsoever, that will go in and collect the data for you. But all these things must have been spelled out in your ethical approval. Then the second question you are talking about, rotational headship. You want to find out you know about it and uh, so the way i can i feel immediately that it can be carried out is that you may need to uh, do a survey of people that have worked under the different individuals or that knows the personality of each of these ones so when these ones when they come up but then you have to really think out what are the things that make for good leadership? Maybe that's a characteristic of the particular individual. So by the time you come up and look at their various characteristics, you're doing like a three, like 360 degrees review. What we mean by 360 degrees review is that the peer, that is people on the same level, will review that individual people that are junior to the individual, people that are senior to the individual. So in other words, you can now outline what are the characteristics required of a leadership, of a leader in a pharmacy setting. So are these things evident in the people, the prospective leaders that are intended to be rotated as heads of these places? So these are the things that we will need to gather and put in the survey 
but it's not it may not be in fact the individuals too may be included in a way it's just like somebody writing why i should be the president of nigeria a manifesto so from there you now do certain analysis you do content analysis you know you actually look at this transformational leadership or transactional leadership what sort of leadership do we need in that place and then, of course, you'll also look at the desirability of having an individual being the sole uh, leader until retirement. You know, it's just like telling us that we just want a head of state that will be there for a lifetime. You know? So is it, is it going to bring some good you know, to the organization? What are the low sides? What are the high, high sides? So these are some of the thoughts that will be put together in designing the instrument for that. Now, we are talking about the age. I don't know in what circumstance you may want to average the age of the, of, of the people in your data collection. But then if you average the age, yes, you can have uh, uh, plus or minus or whatever, because I don't quite, maybe I don't quite understand uh, the scenario of that uh, of that research. I can come in. I can come in. Oh, okay. Please go ahead, yes. Prof. Yes, yes. Uh, I got the question. Actually, he asked the question in my earlier session. Said when so. I, yes, he said said so. Yes. Average, like twenty five plus minus two or something. Um, that is the standard deviation. So when you do, if you have series of ages, for instance, 20 plus 21 plus 22 plus 23, you put the age area of ages of the participants and divide by the number. It will give you the mean. And because if you are using a calculator or a program, it will also tell you deviation of each of those ages from the mean. So a simple a scientific calculator can do that, you just add all the values and divide by the number of observations. It also gives you the standard deviation. So what it means is that if you say that the mean age is 25 years plus minus two, that means if you say plus two, the deviation, highest deviation from the mean will be 27 and lowest deviation from the mean will be 23. So that would tell you the, the cluster, yes. So a simple scientific calculator will do that for you. Then there's a question on testing level of significance, which is part of the uh, data analysis that we handled. Actually, it's not as if you're testing level of significance. When you're doing data analysis, level of significance is assumed in the course of the hypothesis testing. You already assuming from beginning that the level of significance is, for instance, 0 0.05, which means that your confidence interval is 95% and your rejection region is 5%, which translates to 0 0.05. Now, what are we testing when we say uh, significance? If you do your analysis, for instance, you're comparing let me say you're comparing the mean age or mean height of males and females in a class. When you finish, take the average for the females. It may give you something like 1.6 meters, say plus minus 0 0.1. For the males, it will give you something like 1.8 meters, plus minus 0 0.2. Now, ordinarily looking at it, you would tend to say that the males are taller than the females. But statistics will say no, that you cannot say so. Statistics will say that that difference may actually be due to chance, that it is not real. So the only way you will know if there's a difference between the 1.6 meters for females and 1.8 meters for males is when you subject it to statistical analysis, you subject it to hypothesis testing. And when you do that, I may find out that there is really no significant difference between the mean height of the males and females in this sample, which shows that this apparent 0 0.2 difference we found was due to chance. 
and actually that their heights are comparable. That is why we do hypothesis testing to really prove, is there a real difference or is it due to chance? Is there a real association or is it due to chance? That is it. Then uh, let me also say something on the clamor for rotational leadership. If I am to survey this in a facility, something you must assume is that, or we, we, we know is that rotational headship is a policy. So it's not as if we decided that we want it to be rotational or not be rotational, but it's a policy. Now, if you want to change the policy to rotate the headship, there must be some reasons for that. And when Professor Folabi was talking about that a kind of 360 degrees evaluation to see the characteristics of those occupying the position, whether they are suitable, that is one approach. I can also do a simple uh, method of testing the attitude of the pharmacies towards rotational uh, headship. And in which case, I would simply do a questionnaire survey, which has the demographic area as well as the item stems. At the end of the day, you do a subgroup analysis to find out factors that are associated with those who say you should rotate the uh, uh, headship versus those who say you don't. For instance, I might see that those who are in favor might be the, the females. Then you begin to explore why. Or you may see that those who are in favor of rotational uh, uh, leadership or headship are those in the lower cadre. Meanwhile, those who are already in that position may want it to continue, they want the status quo to continue. So that is it. At the end of the day, you want to have evidence to now say, okay, there is evidence for us to say, can we change this policy uh, statement? So I think uh, with this added to the earlier contributions by the uh, presenter, we would have answered this, your questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank, thank you very much, sir. As a yeah, thank you very much, sir. The, that's another question by Dr. Rita, saying with observational study, is, this, is there any community time schedule? With observation oh, study. Okay, I think uh, Professor Folabi can. That's the part of yeah. what uh, was. Yeah. Is, is there any there what? Times, any is that the number time of schedule? times that must be carried out? No, no. Is there any time schedule? Any recommended time schedule for an observation <laughs> study? As in, maybe that's recommended time schedule. That is how long the observation should take. Is that what yes. you mean? Yeah, according to the Dr. Rita. Saying, yeah, it, it depends. Any... It depends on the. It depends on the study you are carrying out. Okay. I mean, you have to look at the literature and read around it. Okay. Well, I thought you were talking of the frequency, but you see, like for instance, the dispensing procedure that we carried out in terms of observation. You know, we we did about three, four replicates, so that at the end of the day, you can now make. Uh, you can now take an average of that the dispensing procedure that I illustrated to Ross. But when it comes to how long, you know, you just sit and be observing somebody. What you can also take into consideration is this. Like for instance, if you are observing them at work, you need to recognize how long do they spend at work? Like for instance, they spend an eight hour work in the pharmacy. I mean, I wouldn't expect you to just go there five minutes and feel that you have concluded your observation. And then I wouldn't expect you to just go there uh, one day and then you just go ahead and tell us that this is what a typical hospital pharmacist day looks like. There's different cycles. Like for instance, when I was working in the hospital, we used to do our watch supply on Wednesdays. Then another day, we do something else. Then another day, we will do compounding. Because that time, we will compound Miss Mag, we will compound the syrup. So assuming we just visit on Monday, and the only thing we did was attending to patients from the clinics. And then you go ahead, and all the pharmacists do in the hospital is just to wait for the patient and do the dispensing. How about the compounding? How about the supply to the world? So you have to look at the cycle of the activities involved. 
then you now turn all your observation in that respect. I hope I made myself a bit clear. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, ma yeah. Then the pharmacist Onuchi, your, your hand was up the right time. Do you still have a question to ask? Dr. Uh, pharmacist Onuchi Ume. Your hand was up. Before you get another question, let me also point out something here, the importance of literature review. Any study you want to carry out, you have to do a thorough literature review to understand the theoretical basis for what you are doing. Like Professor Folabi, the first uh, presentation she made talking about uh, waiting time using a PM, a PM model, which she was borrowing from engineering. And uh, of course, what query models are used in operational research. If you don't know what a query model is, you won't be able to appreciate what she did. So if you are to do it, the first thing to do, first of all, you go and read up. Read it up to understand the method. It's very important. That's why we talk about literature review that will help you to understand what you want to investigate. It can also tell you how it is done. You see previous studies, she quoted some studies that they carried out. You see how they carried it out or how they carried them out. We are always told that there's nothing new under the sun. Everything you want to do has been done by somebody before. So simply look at what, how they did it or somewhere else and then try to replicate what they have done there in your own setting. So please, this is very important. Literature review, in-depth literature review. No matter how little the uh, study you want to carry out is, ensure that you have done an in-depth literature review before you go about uh, doing your own. Thank you, sir. So in the absence of further questions, queries, and contributions, Next is to call on the. Uh, hello, Dr. Bello, please. The, 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 go ahead. Dr. Bello. Yes, you have the floor. Yes. Dr. Bello. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yes. I want to appreciate Prof for the 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 little thing he has just chipped in. Mm. But I I I still want to understand him better. Is it the is it the technical know how how the research was actually carried out in terms of methodology that is embedded in literature review, or the the basic content of what one is set out to investigate? Everything. Everything. That's it. Everything. Everything. In fact, from literature review, you begin to have ideas of the what method to use. Okay. You begin okay. to have ideas of okay. the focus of your research okay. and then the unexplored area in the previous studies. So it gives you a basis. And then of course, when you have obtained your results, you need to be able to anchor it yeah. on the previous finding. So it's either to agree with it okay. or to be in dissonance with it. So that's the essence of a literature review. Okay. Thank you, ma. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is uh, the closing remarks from Dr. Kisley Hamibo, our national chairman. Sorry, can I say something, Dr. Bilu? Before the chairman wraps up. Okay, sir. Yes, so um, having done this now for a two I mean two consecutive, uh, I mean two days, weekend, two consecutive weekends. Yes, so um, I believe we have picked some information, and like we have been saying, it's not just all about listening, but it's all about uh, putting mm. the hands on the deck, trying out something. So how do we follow up? Uh, kind of um, evaluation. At your executive uh, uh, committee level, or even right now, we need to, uh, I want the chairman to have some form of commitment. Are we going to say, those of us who participated in this study, you go back to your various uh, practice settings, identify one or two things, and collect some data, and manage the data. Maybe in your next uh, conference, you can make a small presentation 
that's the only way you will know, you okay. know, you know what is happening in the various uh, facilities to see areas that need improvement. Okay. Uh, so the, let the chairman uh, make some form of commitment. Okay. So let there be some feedback that we'll be getting during your next uh, conference. Otherwise, it will be the same talking talk out that we have been. <laughs> Yeah, just in addition to that, Professor Okwara, it also occurred to me as I was preparing this that, uh, well, it's good to go uh, solo solo on this individually, but even as a group of our pain or a, a, a section of you can also float a research, maybe with respect to what is affecting you, what's going to affect the policy, you know, policy decisions, so you can have a group research within the association, apart from the one that individuals can also embark upon. Okay, noted, ma. Dr. Kinsley, are you still on the call? Dr. Afis, I hope you are noting that. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So next is the chairman closing remarks. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bello. Um, wow. My, my first uh, remark is wow. <laughs> what, what a training we've had uh, uh, in the last two Saturdays. I, 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 I must confess that I'm a happy man. Uh, I, I feel fulfilled. Uh, that uh, our, our objectives I've set at, at the beginning have been have been achieved to a very large extent. Uh, they were talked about uh, objective setting because of very poor research, uh, and uh, we thank God that we did that. And uh, to a large extent, they have been achieved. Uh, our such persons have been able to impact knowledge to our members, no doubt. So we are indeed very grateful. On behalf of uh, I have. National Executive Committee. We also appreciate our resource persons for taking our time to inform and educate our members on conducting the pharmacy based research in this research. We no doubt have been fully enlightened in the course of this series of lectures. I know it's not enough to just uh, receive knowledge. But it's equally, equally important for us to apply the knowledge that we have acquired. Uh, just like Professor Obara mentioned a short while ago, uh, I wish to uh, assure our lecturers that we will go all out to apply the knowledge of acquired from the series of lectures we have received so far. We, like in the area of uh, consultant pharmacy, we have been challenged severally. That uh, it's not just enough to be consultant pharmacists or to answer consultant pharmacists. But uh, one way that we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, show to the world that there's a difference, one way we can showcase the knowledge that the consultant pharmacist possesses, one way we can add value to patient care is through research. And so, one, one follow up from this uh, series of lectures that. As consultant pharmacists, we are going to be challenged to go all out and conduct research, uh, just like we have learned in the course of these lectures, research that will add value to our practice, so, so that we will better improve the image of the pharmacists uh, before other uh, healthcare providers. And then from uh, the last uh, series of lectures we had, we are also going to make sure that uh, we participate in uh, research I will further improve the level of service we render. On the series of lectures we had today on uh, uh, research in pharmacy administration, we'll be go all out to front once in a while evaluate the services that we render with a view to further improving on such services. And then, of course, um, we're, I know that our lecturers and such persons have really, really made a lot of huge sacrifices uh, since Saturday. Starting with uh, Professor Eru, we are most grateful to him, even though he's not here today. 
for you know, blazing the trail, the series of these lectures for Zopara, our friend, our brother. I don't know what we have done with that, but Zopara, as a hospital, as the pharmacist, the college there for us. We're very grateful to you. And uh, Professor Afolabi, you are just, this is the first time we are really engaging uh, you as a uh, I mean, in terms of a lecture to hospital pharmacies, uh, I must confess that, like I said, I enjoyed your lecture thoroughly. And uh, we'll do all our best to make sure that uh, we put to practice what we have uh, learned from you today. Um, Professor, when I didn't make, make a commitment that henceforth, the four of you will uh, collaborate further with hospital and pharmacies. Uh, in the area of uh, joint and collaborative research, and if need be, also assist us in our individual research efforts. So we are very grateful for that uh, commitment that uh, Prof has made to, to us. Uh, we appreciate the our guest of honor, Dr. Daniel Romense, for the admonitions he gave us at the beginning and for declaring today's uh, workshop open. We appreciate Dr. Lolojo a friend of hospital and pharmacies, for making our time to be with us today. Despite the convenience, he has spent about 12 hours or more trying to move from um, Badon to Lagos. I must do some traumatic experience in it. Uh, we also thank the chairman of the AHAP Research Committee and his team, I'm talking about Dr. Uh, Dr. Ladele Obikoya, who just uh, defended his PhD some days back. Uh, we appreciate all the members of the Research Committee for the sacrifices they have made. We appreciate this, then, uh, the committee for putting together this uh, training workshop. I also want to appreciate my fellow NEC members for their support and made this uh, training uh, possible. I appreciate the moderators, Dr. Bellu, Dr. Yawole, and the rest of them for the smooth uh, anchorage of uh, this lecture. I appreciate Dr. Francis Odigie for his uh, beautiful anchorage uh, from last, starting from last week. All of you are serious appreciated, fully appreciated. And then for our members, our half members, we, are, we, are, we, are, we really appreciate you for staying put for two consecutive uh, weekends, despite uh, your, your other conflicting uh, schedules. We appreciate you all for staying put. And then finally, we want to thank Almighty God for making this research webinar a huge success. Thank you all. May God bless you almighty. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you. Our chairman for that beautiful one. Uh, at this point, we have come to, to the end of this very great and detailed thorough training for all pharmacists. I want to end with thank to our guest speakers, our elders, our professors on the call, and all the participants. We thank you for your endurance and uh, for being with us for the past two hours. Is it two hours? Yes, two hours. Two, two and a half hours. We thank you and we say God bless all of us. It's bye for now. See you all the time. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Bye-bye, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Prof. Bye -bye. <laughs>